Oh, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? This lovely morning, another lovely day in paradise. Blue skies, 15 degrees expected later on in the week. Went flying yesterday, that was good fun. Just uh, hootling about in the skies over Kent. There's a few clouds at uh, 5,000 feet, which you can play dodgems with. Anyway, um, it's a Monday, so I'm start of another week. It's wages week, where well, it's a bit of a downer, but uh, we'll see how we go. I'll have to tune into the accounts today and see how they're getting on. So what can we talk about today? How are you, all right? Yeah, how's it going? Okay. I thought uh, I'd talk about a few things that uh, I spoke to the public policy exchange people about. Just a few of the subjects, uh, which included things like uh, government corruption and basically a way a way really to organize the health service so that it cost you know is far more efficient and uh, far more effective in in terms of uh, prevention and, and treatment and the way to do it is not a secret I mean it's actually been around for a long time and it, it is operated in other countries uh, the countries that you know you don't hear about like France where things sort of seem to work okay you know they don't have the National Health Service and they're not out every weekend protesting about the lack of National Health Service so and that's the thing called shared savings so dentistry is a good um, clinical discipline to look at if you're thinking of ways to make the NHS more efficient and more effective and that's because dentistry is a relatively simple subject it's there are only three things that go wrong with teeth one is uh, people don't brush their teeth as well as they or their gums as well as they think they do uh, the second one is everyone eats more sugar than they're prepared to admit and uh, the third one is everything else and, and the good thing is that everything else is not much you know We've got a few people born with um, uh, enamel problems, dent dentina genesis imperfecta and all the sort of the uh, genetic diseases but really not many. So uh, if we could crack the prevention nut in dentistry then we could at least try and roll it out in principle to the rest of the National Health Service. Now the key really to, to all of this is what I call shared savings although it does have other names but the gist of it is this that you what you do is as a contractor a commissioner you contract with a someone to uh, reduce the disease in a population so let's say you contract with a dentist and you say I want you to take on these thousand patients and we estimate the cost of treating these thousand patients is I don't know say let's say a hundred thousand pound a year just about I mean these figures are not you know intended to be realistic they're intended to be simple so that we can do the math right so you've got a thousand patients to look after and a uh, hundred thousand pounds a year to do and then um, if you're very good at your job and you do a lot of prevention and you succeed in bringing the disease levels down in this cohort of patients then you might, for example, bring the cost of treating those patients down to £80,000 a year. And then at this point, under the current system, the Treasury steps in and says, oh, that's, that's very good, well done. Um, we obviously overestimated what you'd need to treat these patients, even though other practitioners may be, uh, have taken all the hundred thousand or might even be asking for more because they've got a budgetary shortfall so but you've been very good and you've done exactly the job that we would have like everyone to do so um, next year we'll just give you 80,000 
to this practitioner who's uh, you know maybe invested more in surgery to achieve this reduction is, is penalized so you're penalized for prevention basically so what's the big diff what's the big uh, twist you know the big uh, way to do it well the answer is to allow the dentist to keep some of the money that he saved and this is how it used to work you know for years since 1948 till about 1996 I think this is what happened the dentist was a self-employed subcontractor in effect and uh, any savings he made uh, he could keep and he used to keep uh, he used to keep the savings and then um, the Treasury at the end of the year looked at what they spent overall and uh, reduced the budget overall in other words they reduced the fees and they made an attempt to claw back you know if we'd gone over budget they used to make an attempt to claw it back so there was a sort of a symbiotic relationship between the dentists who were constantly you know driving trying to drive costs down and the Treasury that was constantly adjusting their estimate of what uh, it cost to treat the patients now the key to this is, is a couple of things first of all it's no use the dentist being employed in this scenario because um, we know what happens when you employ anybody uh, but we know in particular what happens when you employ a dentist which is that say a dentist who perhaps who may have been working in general practice is finally told that he's going to be commissioned and employed and so he immediately uh, puts in an order for the chair that he's always wanted and uh, he pays the staff what he's always wanted to pay them and he uh, starts ordering materials that he, he would know wouldn't have been able to have afforded if he was running his own surgery and he'll just work at the pace that he feels that he always deserved and not at the pace that's necessary to uh, break even or make a profit or, or finish within budget so let me just pause a second at the junction of death So salarying, salarying people and sort of micromanaging them, which is the way, which is the route that the Department of Health has gone down, is not um, at all tenable. You know, it's just not a bright idea. Having self-employed subcontractors who participate in the provision of services on a shared savings basis is a very smart move. And it is the way that dentistry used to work when dentistry used to work. So everybody harkens back to the 1980s, you know, when there were half the number of dentists on the register that there are now, and you could get NHS treatment at any single surgery. They'd be happy to take you on. Uh, and the quality of the work was generally good, you know, probably about as good as private work is now. Um, and yet they don't realize that, that at that time, NHS dentists weren't on the NHS. They were private self-employed subcontractors to the NHS and had been that way since 1948. Because in 1948, the government decided to buy out the doctors and buy all the doctors premises and put all the doctors on a salary. Whereas they didn't want to do that to the dentists. So they didn't buy the dentist surgeries, they uh, didn't put dentists on a salary, they just said to the dentist, look, we'll come up with a system whereby if you need to do a filling or a set of dentures, then just bill us, you know, we, we, won't, we don't want your establishment costs or your staff costs, just put in a bill for the filling. And uh, that system worked really well. I mean, both systems worked, both systems worked really well because there wasn't so much health speculation and expectations were lower but that piecework system worked really until the uh, late 80s and was responsible for the you know dentists earning a, a being being wealthy so wealthy that they became legendary for the money they could earn if they worked hard enough uh, but for every dentist that uh, over earned and earned a fortune there was somewhere 
else there was a dentist who was just coming up to retirement who, who didn't earn anything at all and that's because overall the system broke even but not in the case of any individual dentist they might do better or worse than average but overall the system finished within budget so which is all the Department of Health wanted but as soon as you start suggesting to the Department of Health or any of the you know the snowflake generation that uh, having self-employed subcontractors provide NHS services is the, uh, the panacea and the solution to the problem we've got was uh, lack of treatment you know to the point where it has to be rationed by NICE and uh, commission services you know continually falling down on their service level agreements and going over budget um, they will start clucking about um, privatisation of the National Health Service and that is is quite simply because they don't know what they're talking about <laughs> they honestly don't know that uh, in, certainly in dentistry it was completely provided by the private service the, the private sector you know until they decided in the you know subsequent to the contract debacle in the 1992 and and for you know in 2006 that um, the dentistry will be better off as a fully commissioned and micromanaged nationalized in all but name service which has led us to the, the cluster whatever we've got now so the Labour Party has just said that they are going to put a complete ban on private contractors prov uh, providing anything to the National Health Service they want the National Health <laughs> the National Health Service is going to end up like the Chinese army you know where <laughs> It just employs everybody and everything does everything so and that's absolutely not you know I mean that is the old Union Union of Soviet Socialist Republic approach to the economy and to the market which is time and time again has been demonstrated to be a failure um, but there is this sort of naive view that any uh, work done for the National Health Service that isn't done by someone who's being paid by the National Health Service is is a bad thing and I think you know you have to sort of get to the bottom of what what's behind that objection I mean is it really just a lack of appreciation of history a lack of appreciation of uh, how the system works is it is it stupidity is it just a lack of uh, brain cells and IQ you know is it how how do these people um, reconcile and you know the fact that a lot of laboratory tests I would imagine are, are done by private laboratories I mean are they providing services to the National Health Service are they are they self-employed subcontractors or are they fully employed within the National Health Service you know you have to with this organization that with an organization that size you have to decide what you're going to um, what you're going to do in-house and what you don't want to do in-house and it's just a fact of life that subcontracting stuff out to uh, a third party who's going to be far more concerned with uh, cutting costs you know and and keeping expenses in, in check um, is is in almost always more efficient than doing it yourself you know. so I, I mean probably under the circumstances where there's it's it's a monopsony and there's only one provider of a service then that might be d different you know you might find and you find that a lot in the armed forces because in the armed forces there's not you know if you want to a part for Lockheed Martin fighter then then you have to go to Lockheed Martin and that's where you have to sort of uh, negotiate a contract which includes maintenance you know includes spares and includes servicing and things like that 
rather than do it on an ad hoc basis. But um, the way you, that would work from a dentist's point of view is that you know you've got your thousand patients, you've got your hundred thousand pound a year. Next year you've got uh, eighty thousand pound a year, which you know was enough last year to treat that number of patients, and. Uh, you've also let's say you've got ten thousand pounds because the treasury has split the split the difference with you so the twenty thousand you saved they took back ten but they let you keep ten and they've got ten that they would never have had but they never see it like that they they think well we could have had twenty <laughs> you know, we could have we we shouldn't have let that guy keep any of that we should have you know he went he was under budget and that budget is required for the dentist up the road who's seen the same number of patients but paradoxically needed 120,000 um, pounds and you know and all these patients are screaming because they're not the treatments not getting finished and uh, right into their MPs and stuff so we, we need to take that 20,000 off the guy who's doing it really well and giving it to the guy who's doing it really badly which is you know I mean on the face of it is a it's crazy isn't it I mean just saying it makes me think you know this is a crazy way the system works but this is the way the system works if you could work on a shared savings basis then you could achieve quite a lot because you'd get yourself into a virtuous circle where um, because you would carried out a lot of prevention on these patients then the year after that they would need less work the old uh, fee for item system was um, a very, um, it, it was a repeat, a low quality repeat restorative system where people used to have a filling and then not much work was done on diet and so like two or three years later they needed another filling, you know, or they got more decay in the same tooth. There was no prevention done under the system and that, you know, you could say, well that's a valid criticism, Derek your self-employed subcontractors they weren't really doing much prevention they were being paid fee for item and where was their motivation to do any prevention and I agree that's that is correct they didn't um, in a system that uh, uh, where you're paid fee for item there is not much there's no <clears throat> there's no reason for you to do any prevention <clears throat> But you can, what you can do is you can take on more patients. So the way it works is that um, you've got you've got your thousand patients, which you're now being paid eighty pounds a year for, and some spare capacity. Let's say twenty percent spare capacity, uh, which is one day a week empty for the sake of argument. You know, two sessions out of ten, and the health authority comes along and says, "You look, Derek, um, we want you to take on another." To, uh, 200 patients and because these are new and you know they they come with the full budget attached so we're going to give you 20,000 to go with these patients so you know it's the old 100,000 for for a thousand patients rate so you think well I'll, you know I'll take them on because I'm gonna get I know that they're only gonna cost me uh, 80 pounds a year to cure and I'm getting paid a hundred pounds a year to take them on so what you do is you take them on and then after a year later you've got them down to 80 pounds a year and perhaps you've got the other ones down to 60 pounds a year you know the ones that have been with you two years and so you get like a virtuous circle where patients where, where dentists are taking on more and more patients and <clears throat> are quite happy because they're um, not only are they treating the patients and uh, making a profit they're able to keep the sort of any super profit that they make or at least a share of it and the Treasury is happy because it's budgeting uh, say a hundred thousand a year per dentist and it's only spending 90 and the politicians are happy because uh, every dentist wants to take on new patients now now if that isn't the solution to healthcare, I don't know what is, and I think I do know what is, 
and I think I think that is the solution and I'd love if anyone's watching this can find a hole in that logic or say to me yeah Derek this won't work because etc 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 then please let me know but then you might say well look if it's as obvious as the tail on a dog's bum why isn't it being done and the answer is it it was suggested in the 1950s this system it's it's been called all sorts of things it's been called the voucher system it's been called grant in aid it's been there's no end of names for it and the reason why it had so many names is because it was such a good system that people kept trying to bring it up with the Department of Health and they wouldn't consider it if it was if it had the same name as the system that they looked at and rejected so that then begs the question why does the Department of Health reject systems which on the face of it would solve the problems that they've got and the answer is that they are, there's a very very great antipathy within the Department of Health to adopting a, uh, any system which did not originate within the Department of Health so they truly believe themselves to be masters of the universe and more than capable of uh, solving you know imposing their ideas on the market which is what they do really they don't they don't believe in a free market they they believe that in a free market they wouldn't need to exist so the mere fact that they exist proves that it's not supposed to be a free market it's supposed to be a market under their influence and control I think it's certainly under their influence but not in a good way and it's certainly not under their control so they won't entertain any idea that first of all didn't come from within Richmond House or secondly um, Or secondly is, is a you know is what they would see as a step backwards a step a reconsideration of something that one of their predecessors looked at and rejected and uh, these things are not these things are not rejected because they're bad ideas they're rejected because they would upset the status quo and they would have to acknowledge that uh, the experts who formulated and proposed and could continue to talk cogently on these ideas were external <laughs> to the Department of Health and they just can't have that they just can't have that they, I know it sounds stupid but they would rather persist with a stupid system that doesn't work which is their stupid system than uh, a quite a clever and elegant system which would work really well but over which you know but where where they would be sitting in the audience instead of sitting on the stage and that's just it that's why you know we have a we don't just have a failure of um, NHS dentistry and the NHS in particular but we have a failure of governance the people who are supposed to be clever and we all everybody assumes are clever and in charge of us <laughs> for, 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 for I don't know somebody explain to me why um, are not at all clever and not at all suited to purpose and not at all and the Department of Health is not a meritocracy it, it's not populated by super intelligent people or super clever people or super knowledgeable people or high achieving people it's just it's just populated by uh, people who seek power and are very difficult to winkle out of those positions of authority because once they're once they're there they're like a tick on a dog <laughs> you just can't especially if they're unelected which a lot of the um, dental guys are in the House of Lords and and in Richmond House so anyway there we are 
that's the way to solve it and uh, as I say if you can blow a hole in that then great then do but I bet you can't I bet you can't all right nice to talk to you bye